Hello, Space Watchers, and welcome back to a new episode of Space Cafe Radio. I'm Emma, and today I want to explore with you a recent event in space policy that has ruffled some feathers. Let's leave the known path of space science and venture into the complex world of international policy. On November the 15th of 2021, Russia conducted an anti-satellite, also called HAZAT, test in low Earth orbit. A missile of the Noodle ground base as a system was used to destroy one of Russia's own derelict satellites, called Cosmos 1408. The satellite was at an orbit of about 480 kilometers in altitude, and the interception created at least 1,500 pieces of trackable debris. Let's state immediately that Russia is not the only one conducting this type of test. China, India, the US did all sorts of ASA testing in the past decade. However, the geopolitical climate right now is getting hotter and hotter, with Russia being at the door of Ukraine and space becoming more and more of an economical and strategic asset. So it's worth reading this event, not only as a technology matter, but also as a piece of contemporary history unveiling in front of us. There are several interpretations around the Russian asset attack. Some experts suggest the commercial space angle. Russia created extra debris in low orbit to disrupt the rapid evolution of the commercial space sector. Others though suggest a military interpretation. Russia believes that the US is developing weapons that could attack from space and feel the need to develop weapons that can fight back. So we ask three experts in space policy and debris tracking, what was their view on the matter? Our three guests were Prof. Kai Wei Shogel, Honorary Professor of International Technology Policy at the University of Tübingen in Germany, Victoria Sampson, Washington Office Director at Secure World Foundation, and Valentin Eden, Industrial Engineer and CEO of Space Analysis. They analyzed for us the issue under a strategic, political, and satellite communication point of view, adding to it a European a U.S. and an international angle. We try in this way to hear out multiple views and balance the regional differences. Here are my questions and the answers. My first question is which weapon they were actually testing? Were they testing the missile? Like testing their country space ability to strike an object in space? Or were they testing the splash damage, the ability to use the debris like a boomerang to hit other objects, or they wanted to actually create extra debris. Primarily, it will certainly have been a kind of anti-satellite test, a kinetic weapon aimed from the ground to a derelict satellite. I think that's the, the primary focus of this activity. Of course, there are secondary effects which can be studied. I think all the analysts and all the analysis itself also points to the first one. This was Professor Schrogel. I mean, these are all strong possibilities. If you look at what the Russian Ministry of Defense said, they were very careful in their language when they said they had a test and a satellite was destroyed. <laughs> so, I mean, most people would read that to say, oh, they admitted they had an anti-satellite test. Not quite. So as far as we can tell, the Russians tested their noodle missile defense interceptor, which is a ground-based anti-satellite interceptor against one of their own satellites. We go into quite a bit of detail in Secure World Foundation's counter space threat assessment, which is available on our website for free. And we have the executive summary and translated into French, Spanish, English, Russian, and Mandarin, just to put a little plug there. My boss always likes me to talk about our products um, fine. also for free. But yeah, so it's really hard to say what the end goal was there. Where they try, they've actually tested something called co orbital interceptors. Basically, the idea that an object gets up in space, gets into orbit, and then does a close approach and, you know, does some sort of attack that way. But they'd never done an intercept attempt, as far as we know, from a ground based interceptor, which is kind of unusual because you see, okay, looking at the history of anti satellite tests during the Cold War, you had the US and Soviet Union, and the US tested ground based ones. And then we did that in 2008. The Chinese did a ground-based one in 2007. And the Indians did one in 2019. So you could argue that maybe the Russians just wanted to check that box <laughs> to identify that they could do a ground-based anti-satellite test. 
There's a possibility that they were just doing a flyby, maybe. They'd had about 10 flights of this interceptor. And so maybe they were just trying to get it close to see if they could hit it. You know, that, something like that happened. There's still a lot of information that's lacking in terms of, you know, what their intentions were. That was Victoria Sampson. And now we hear from Valentin Heider. I think you can't isolate it to one of these lists. Of course, there is the test to check if my weapons work. And on the other side, it's do I uh, hit target? And the third reason is to occupy a certain area in space that others are hardly to use. What's at stake here? What is Russia's strategy? Everybody will lose if space operations and space applications, space services cannot be undertaken in a proper way. And this is where everybody also said, why is Russia doing that? It's endangering also its own activities. It's endangering Russian cosmonauts on board of the ISS. But then what you see, it has a geostrategic issue in it and a source in it, which means Hey, pay attention to us. It's not only US and China, it's also Russia, which wants to sit at the table with eye level. Let us in, let us be part of that new, let's say, governance of of space, which of course we cannot also as Europeans, but where you now say, okay, I have understood what the motivations of Russia are. Now let's try to put that into something constructive and work on a ban, at least, of these weapons. Okay, so you interpret this as a leverage move in a sort of way from Russia, just to say, hey, we want to be part of this negotiation, we want to be part of the next step. Yes, indeed. And it's absolutely clear, not only from the way they have been doing that, also from the timing, it's absolutely evident that it was not anything specifically threatening the one or the other country. It was more a kind, we are possibly on a diplomatic decline globally, but we want to get back and we want to be treated as uh, a superpower. I would say the action from the strategic point of view, like a shoot across the bows. On the political side, in the COCOS yep. meetings, there is no real progress to go further to stop the deployment of satellites and to use orbits and to get an agreement about the space traffic management. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the U.S. is just establishing facts by licensing commercial satellites, constellations. And I think the Russians, one reason might be, like others say, is that to stop this deployment, to stop the establishing of facts of territory occupation by the U.S., I think that is one of the reasons of the Russians, what can be interpreted in a sense. Hmm. From the data size, from the deployment size, it's a very interesting orbit mm -hmm. where the shooting happens. The shooting happens roughly at 460 kilometers. Mm -hmm. What is exactly between the parking orbit of the star mm -hmm. constellation to deploy the satellites and between the target orbits of about 550 kilometers, you can see one attempt to kind of establish a minefield between the parking orbit or in the parking orbit and at the target orbit. The second problem might also be is a kind of testing the capabilities of Starlink to maneuver around the space debris. So if they are good, then nothing happens. If they fail, we might have a problem of a chain collision in the Starlink constellation. What's the EU and the US take on this? Well, of course, the European position is that this is a threat to all space operations, regardless whether you have many satellites or whether you have only one satellite, you are endangered with your space assets 
And for some countries, the one or the two or the five satellites as, are as important as the hundreds and hundreds of satellites of others. So all the space operators feel threatened by this activity. Well, I mean, it is a concern. I think the U.S. has a lot invested in space infrastructure. So I think the, you know, particularly when you look at the mega constellations right now, there's about, I want to say 1,800 active Starlink satellites up there. Uh, that, that's out of roughly maybe 5,000 satellites total. So they're, they're a big chunk, the total satellite population. So obviously, you know, they're concerned. And one thing that I find very interesting about all this is that China has been extremely quiet about this anti-satellite test. I think they've kind of made words where they acknowledge that something happened, but they're still waiting to hear more. And, you know, China has invested a tremendous amount in its space capabilities, not just their civil space program, which you know, China has a space station with taken notes up there that are, you know, whose lives are in, da in danger with all this. Russia downplayed the accident, declaring it was harmless. Was it? Of course not. And this is diplomacy. We, we also saw that the Russian foreign minister first denied what has happened. Well, this is diplomatic folklore, but it is a power play. And if you see these are rational actors in outer space, which you might doubt when you see the debris created. But nevertheless, you have to assume that all these are rational actors. Then we can start working on solutions. We can start working on ways out of this dilemma. And we can remember and recall also what during the Cold War was successful, which was transparency, confidence building measures, as well as arms control. I mean, and that's not unusual. I mean, the Indians had their anti satellite test in 2019. They said, look, hey, we did it at a low altitude. We did it responsibly. All the debris is going to be gone within six weeks, which actually did not happen. I think it took, I want to say like a year and a half, two years. Uh, well, it's mm -hmm. been two years. So it's about a year and a half for all the debris mm -hmm. to get out to be deorbited. So it's, again, it's unusual to downplay that. And the Russian officials definitely said, look, you know, we didn't see any. The debris is fine, you know, basically saying it's not going to be an issue, which is a bold statement to make considering that you have all this piece of debris at, at altitudes where there's, you know, plenty of other satellites, hundreds of other satellites. You don't control it. That's the whole point of debris. You cannot move it around. It's just kind of once it's going, it's going, and you have to figure out how to move around it. I think that was more trying to send diplomatic messaging than anything else. How shall we proceed? Where do we go from here? Where do we go as United Nations? Where do we go as space international community? Well, it is a question of the UN, but it's even more a question of these four countries to go inside and ask themselves, okay, now we have proven to everybody and to our potential adversaries that we can do that. Now it's the point, possibly, it is the real point and possibly the very best point to sit down and say, okay, now that everybody knows, we can sit down and we can then declare there will be a moratorium. There will be no anti-satellite test again. Maybe we even put that into an agreement. It might be an agreement amongst these four would start, but it shouldn't in the end be an agreement which has to be worked out in the United Nations and which has then go through the United Nations General Assembly and possibly also we could set up an agreement. It doesn't have to be 20 pages long. It can be rather short and dismiss the intentional creation of debris by such uh, tests. Well, my personal point of view is that we should in any case avoid anarchy in outer space. Anarchy in outer space will hurt everybody. We have an excellent governance of outer space with the Outer Space Treaty, with the idea of space as a global common, free for all, free access to outer space. Everybody can use outer space on an equitable manner. We should try to maintain that with all diplomatic and political means. And we should not be irritated by such activities like anti-satellite tests, but to the contrary, this should strengthen the idea of outer space as a global common. 
Well, it's really interesting because in multilateral fora that talk about space security issues, they've just been stuck for decades now. There's not been forward movement. There's been disagreements in terms of what the biggest threat is of space security and stability. And then how would you go about fixing it? Russia and China and their allies have been laser focused on the idea that space-based missile defense, i.e. deliberately designed weapons placed in orbit, are the biggest threats to space security and stability. Now, is anyone actually doing that? No. The U.S. and its allies have been focused more on almost space as an environmental issue. It's congested, it's contested, it's competitive. And that's the biggest threat to space security and stability. We need to look more at behavior as opposed to feeling the technology concerns. So the arguments have been going round and round for years. And it's just within the past couple of years, actually past a year and a half or so, that there's been a shift to really focus more on responsible behavior as opposed to technological limitations. And there was a resolution of the United Nations in December 2020, co-sponsored by the United Kingdom, that basically said, okay, we, and it was passed by a pretty big majority, that called for countries to submit to the UN Secretary General of reports that said three things. One, what do they see as the biggest threat to space security? Two, what do they think is responsible behavior in space or alternatively irresponsible behavior? You know, kind of two sides in the same coin. And then three, what methods do they think the national community should take forward to get this conversation going? Roughly about 30 countries submitted their reports to the UN Secretary General. Secure World was part of civil society that was allowed to support um, send one as well. So we did that. And if you read the submissions, it's really interesting because they're not all identical, obviously. But you do see some trends forming. You see, you know, kind of the, I would say, norms emerging in that it's considered, you know, bad form to deliberately create large amounts of debris on orbit. It's considered bad form to do a close approach that's non-consensual to other countries' satellites. One should act with due regard of other actors in space, you know, to one should avoid deliberate harmful interference. So these are not new ideas. Some of those ideas are enshrined in the Outer Space Treaty, but, you know, I think it's important that you see kind of a gelling around those concepts. And then at the same time, over the last summer, the U.S. Secretary of Defense released a memo talking about norms of behavior for space and a lot of those same ideas were actually encapsulated in those five norms. So I think there's actually potential for progress. For the international community, I would say it would be very important to agree about a um, kind of deployment and use of orbital shells. It's a kind of territory spacing or something like that to say, okay, guys, we are using it here. You are using it there. And this is for public use could be like in an analogic, like frequency sharing, Let's say, okay, police have this uh, frequency and these are free frequencies and these commercial frequencies, like we have it in the mobile networks. This could be one approach. Fantastic. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Shogal. And I will, I hope to have the chance to talk to you again, maybe uh, no after an asset attack on a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> yes, then let's look for more peaceful opportunity. Victoria, thank you very much. Is there something you would like to add that I didn't ask you? No, I think actually your questions were pretty thorough. Fantastic. Valentin, thanks a lot. Is there anything else you would like to add that I didn't ask you? No, I uh, think we have covered all. Thank you very much to all our guests for these invaluable insights in the world of space geopolitics. I promise I will get back on this topic because if there is something that I'm sure of is that this is not the end of it. But it is the end of our episode and it's all for now from Space Cafe Radio and from me. Till next time, bye.